Hi everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Erin, for such a great performance. I've been to his workshop um, and it's fun, it's really fun. Um, he makes it look really easy. Uh, one of the first things he said was, um, be careful when you play the duff because it can hit you in the face if you're not careful. And the first thing I did was I hit myself in the face. It's absolutely no coordination at all, but I do recommend it. If you, it's, it's, it's fun, but just don't hit yourself in the face. <laughs> Okay, the first poem I'm going to read is um, from the anthology Out of Bounds by Blood Axe. This was published a couple of years ago. Um, various writers throughout England, uh, Black and Asian writers, were commissioned to write poems um, which would form a creative map. So you had to write about your hometown. I'm from Preston, and uh, so I thought about Preston and what I could write. So I wrote 17 poems in three weeks and two got accepted. This poem's about my mum, and it's about language, it's about losing language, and gaining language, and holding on to language. <coughs> A book closer to home. Every Saturday, mum took us to the library. We dispersed into different parts of the room, craving this yellow smell of bound paper and a peep into lives we did not live, where tea was not chai, but dinner. Mum sat in the Urdu section, soon dissolving into a magazine full of squiggles that only made sense to her. Her large almond eyes smiled. Her soft fingers turned the pages, pausing while she glanced at us with motherly duty. We sat with our books on the carpeted floor, following the curves and lines of English with our fingertips. The red signs on the mahogany shelves, silencing our tongues. The next poem I'm going to read is called Blackpool. Um, I wrote this a long time ago, I only workshopped it last uh, week at one of the workshops, so it's still got the notes in it. So I might edit it as I read. <laughs> Blackpool. Our parents took us every summer, five of us packed in the back of a cortina without seatbelts. Dad wearing a well-pressed shirt, mum bride-like adorned with gold. At the pleasure beach, we had a few gentle rides that wouldn't risk death, but were uncertain enough to slightly dislodge our hearts. Then we'd find a bench, sit down and have fish and chips, the wind coating our faces with salty air. Then a walk on the beach, bags of candy floss ballooning from my sister's cram mimicking my mother's inflated shawar under her embroidered gamis. We were lined up in age order, so Dad could take photos with his new camera, soon to fill our family album, in which there was only us. Photos sent to relatives in Pakistan, who asked a million questions about this exotic place. Photos that captured a temporary joy, a one-day holiday away from our permanent existence. Next poem I'm going to read is um, from this book, Sweet Tongues, which was uh, published in uh, late last year, and uh, they're launching it in Wigan today, as I was meant to be there as well. And it's hard to be in two places at the same time. We were in Chorley Food, we the Chorley Food Festival last week, so that was fun. Um, so this is published by Common Word, which is just down the road. That's where my creative home, that's where I began. And I had three or four poems and I didn't know what to do with them. And uh, so they provide um, a platform for all writers and um, on a local level. So they're quite good. So I'm very proud of them. So do support us, do buy the book. The poem is about my late sister-in-law. Um, she died a couple of years ago, my brother's late wife. Um, she was 36 and she was diagnosed with cancer on um, the 7th of December and she died on the 21st, so it was very sudden. 
Um, and uh, six months later, I found myself in, the, in my brother's house because I had to look after him. Um, and I had to cook. So I opened this cupboard and I saw several jars uh, with labels that she, you know, she written herself. And I looked at the letter I and it had a loop, all the letter R's had loops in them. And I think what I'm trying to say here is that you, you notice things about people when they're no longer there. Little things. <coughs> Turmeric. The little loops in your R's make me smile as I skim labels on jars in your cupboard. Garam masala, meat tenderizer. You rushing about from cooker to sink, from cupboard to table, neglected peels on a newspaper, the smells of new recipes, unknown flavors, bottles of fizz, steam on the window. That old tea towel with fading herbs. Hot ladles of chatter warming our plates as the sun closes its eyes. I turn one jar of turmeric to see the whole label yellowed by the rush of your fingertips and jaundice in your eyes. Touching the label, I think of your gravestone, then holding the jar your coffin. It's as if in mid-chore, while staring, you went to answer the phone but forgot to come back. It's as if these jars are still waiting for your return. Uh, the next play I'm going to read um, is uh, called Starching. And when I lived in Pakistan, I um, led to starch cotton clothes because you need to do that in the summer because it's so hot and the cotton that women wear is very thin so if you don't starch it, it sticks to you and um, this, this poem is about simplicity, simplicity of life and simplicity in the cosmetics that we use and wear and um, um, I think um, every time we visited we always took relatives something from England so a bottle of Nivea was very special and she would, my aunt would actually put this, uh, you know, anything that we get, she'd put it away. So I found this bottle of Nivea cream, and the poem sort of leads to that. Starching. She empties the rice into a colander, lets the, collects the water in a bowl, lets it cool. The wash area is a tap, a hose pipe, a bowl, and a drain. We sit on stools made of weaved nylon. She soaks the cotton shalwar in the milky bowl, swirling it with her brown hands, then squeezing it. I see her discoloured and brittle fingernails. The clothes look sticky. The starch looks like wallpaper paste pooling onto the blue mosaic tiles beneath us. She then rinses the garments three times under the tap. We hang them up to dry in February's breeze and then sit inside so that I can smooth her hands with whatever I can find, a forgotten bottle of Nivea cream. Uh, next poem I'm going to read is, um, as um, Dave mentioned, um, is called The Last Prayer and I'm shortlisted in the National Manchester is a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> Manchester International Religious Poetry Competition a couple of years ago. And uh, this poem came about when I was, um, came across a verse in the Quran um, that was very, it's full of imagery, um, and uh, it just struck me that the Quran is essentially a, a book of poetry. And I thought, let's, you know, sort of use that and fictionalize. The Last Prayer. After the warning is signalled by the horn, the earth and sky will shatter. If my book of good is heavier on the scales, and I cross the bridge of fine thread, I will ascend to the gates of the first heaven. When they offer me fruits in pairs, or garments of green silk, or ask me to taste from the canals of honey and milk, I will refuse and wait patiently, barefoot, 
on the soil of saffron and pebbles of pearls and rubies just there by the gate for you. Okay, I've got a last poem. <laughs> Have I got time? I think that's it. I'm dead. I'm all of them actually. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd have it. It was in a sheet of paper on my day. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Um, <laughs>